old folks in 114. Uh, let's see. Today is. Ah, sorry. I'm losing my grip here. On reality, too. Um, today is Monday, March 29th. So we are covering section A4. As I reminded myself over here. Okay. The packet that I have for you looks like this. This is incidentally the last um, section from May 4, not from Chapter 8. Um, these are some diagrams that I've compounded from, compiled from the textbook, i.e., I stole them. Um, so if you are not following along, at least you have this uh, as a reference. Some of these are um, intuitive uh, classifications of what is a polyhedra versus what is a prism versus what is um, a pyramid. They're all polyhedra, but those other two terms are more specific. What would be most practical, of course, would be this page. I'm sorry, but you have to read this sideways too. These are the volume and surface area formulas for these types of shapes. Right? Um, in general. When you get down to here, uh, let me just give you a heads up, the uh, the PRISM formula, when you see a capital B, all right, the reason why it's it's sort of generalized as uh, the area of the base right, is because your PRISM may be some other shape, you know, than say what this is, trapezoidal. So it's better to have the generalization rather than the specific formulas. You can, in, you could, in other words, you can determine what it is, you know. Just realize that you're going to use the area of whatever the base shape is. Right. Then there's the examples. I'll go through these. And, and that's it. Where's uh, my phone? It is not quite new. Good. All right. Uh, let me give you an overview, as I'm inclined to do. Hopefully, these markers will cooperate. Um, let me sort of give myself a little scaffolding here, just to keep things in order. You don't have to do this yourself, but for me, I have such limited board space that if I don't do this, I find that I get out of hand. We're talking about, in general, solid, as in three-dimensional uh, space figures. Right, a figure as in a shape. Right. Now, just beware, uh, a kid will come up to you as a, when you're a teacher, and they'll say uh, something along the lines of, when you want me to find the area, do you want me to find the space inside? And the, the answer to that question is, yeah. Uh, you go, yes, but then you have to tell them, reserve the word space to things that are actually three-dimensional, because the volume is really a capacity, which is really a space. When we're referring to uh, the inside of something that is two-dimensional, it would be better to say surface. That is a little bit more alien, especially to a little kid. I understand space, right? But a surface is a little bit more sophisticated. Anyhow, space is all three-dimensional, right? And this is very general, right? This is a generalization. So if you were to classify space figures, or the, uh, to give some examples of space figures there, a lot of a hodgepodge catch-all of things that are three-dimensional. So you have firstly cubes, which are naturally three-dimensional, right? And then slightly um, less specific rectangular solids, which are elongated cubes, if you will. And um, cones uh, and cylinders and even spheres. Okay. If you're going to refer to these things, I'm sorry, my black marker is kind of dying, um, collectively, let me get out a new one here. Um, they would best be uh, 
grouped as space figures in general, okay? If you want to start categorizing some of these uh, a little bit more precisely, right, um, then there are other phrases, which is why I've cut this up into three spaces for myself, my own sake even, right? There's this phrase, first of all, uh, polyhedron. And the plural of that would be polyhedra. These are a subcategory of the space figures. All right, so this is more specific, this, this term, polyhedra. And from them, you might have, you might, there are some, there are even further still subcategories of this phrase. Right? Um, in general, right, when you think a polyhedron, uh, think a three dimensional shape. But um, a three dimensional shape that has faces. Right? That's sides. Something like a sphere doesn't really have a face, it has a surface, right? We don't say that it has a face, we say that it has a surface. And at least the, um, the, uh, the circumference of a cylinder would be a similar thing. We say that it has a surface, right? and a cone as well, it has a surface. The same, that's a little bit more general, a little less specific. Something like a cube or a rectangular uh, solid has faces, right? They have planes, you know? Okay. A subcategory, naturally, of polyhedra would be something like, um, well, um, a regular polyhedra. That has uh, even more precise conditions that would be met, even more specific. Right. A regular polyhedron would be something like um, um, the condition that all faces are regular polygons. Now you may remember from the last section, uh, what qualifies something as a regular polygon? Um, it's referring to the interior angles. All interior angles. Are the same. Are equal. And um, all side lengths are equal. So it is equi equi equiangular and equilateral, right? That would qualify that. Anyhow, if you would take that to the nth, uh, well, the third degree, uh, and you're talking about something that's three-dimensional, i.e. a real thing rather than a virtual thing, regular polygons are comprised of faces that are all regular polygons. Polyhedrons, all faces are regular polygons. Okay. There's another term for this, um, and I'll fit it in here. They call these platonic solids. And rather than just to turn on my uh, projectile, I'll just flash these here. There are exactly five platonic solids. Right. Here you see a sort of a pyramidal sort of shape, a cube. Um, a dodecahedron, uh, looks like an octahedron, and icosahedron, I think I'm mispronouncing that. Uh, one thing that you notice about these shapes is that their faces, their sides, are all the same type of um, polygon. Right? 
and so they're all the same shape. Um, one thing I probably should add to this then, all faces are regular polygons. The same regular polygon. Okay. All right. Then there are these other categories. Um, there are prisms. Prisms is a, a, a second category, if you will, of polyhedron. And it's probably better to just describe it according to how it looks. Um, there are, in the case of a prism, two bases. Uh, let's see. Connected. by what they call okay. lateral faces. Sometimes that happens. Um, that is faces side by side. All right, that are pal parallelograms. Remember, parallelogram is a more general term than, say, its subcategories as well. A rectangle is an example of a parallelogram. And it just so happens that if you have um, a prism that the parallelograms are not crooked in any way, they're not slanted in any way, they're just 90 degree angles, you could have a subcategory of this, which is called a right prism. If the sides are rectangles, right. uh, you might notice while you're digging through the chapter there are these right uh, cylinders. It implies that the sides are basically at a 90 degree angle as well. What you should emphasize here is um, uh, these two conditions here. Right? There are two bases, and the bases are again polygons. And then there are lateral faces that are connecting. All right, and lateral faces just mean uh, side by side, essentially. Okay. Then there is yet a third category, at least according to our book here. We have actual pyramids. And pyramids are distinct from prisms uh, because, why is that? They have one base rather than two. Okay. And all the lateral faces come to a point. point, of course, being uh, a vertex is how you would refer to that if you want to be perfectly technical. Okay. Right. And that's a good overview, I think. All right. So just to recap here, you have real, tend to be, these are real things that can be drawn on a piece of paper, of course, but real objects are three-dimensional. All right. Um, in general, we will refer to them as space figures because they take up an amount of space, right? They have a volume, you might say, right? But a sphere can also be a space figure, right? All right, a cone or a cylinder, which is not exactly like these other two things, cubes or rec the rectangular solids, they are space figures, right? Regular, then there are polyhedrons, things that have actual sides, defined, clearly defined planes, basically form the surfaces that enclose them, all right? There are regular polyhedrons, in which case there is the same polyhedron face, uh, pardon me, the same polygonal regular polygon face uh, enclosing the solid, all right? Then there are prisms, in which case you see 
uh, two of the same type of shape, essentially connected by parallelograms, sometimes rectangles, sometimes just, you know, more generally parallelograms. All right, so like a slanted rectangle, if you will. Um, pyramids have only one base, right? And their lateral faces are connected at a vertex, okay? So I hope that that helps. All right, now, um, just a flash here again. All right, you have these generalizations here. These are all space figures. A subcategory is the platonic solids. Again, platonic solid is another way of saying regular polyhedron. Right. And you can see, here are the examples of some prisons, right? They have a top base and a bottom base. All right, that's somewhat counterintuitive, but remember in space, no, you know, what weighs up, right? It doesn't really matter. They are connected by, in this case, it looks like rectangles all the way around. All right, technically a, a cube, right? There's also a prism and has, if you want to think about it as having a top base and a bottom base, again, connected all the way around by lateral faces that coincidentally happen to be, um, you know, uh, cube uh, squares. Here you have a hexagonal prism, all right? The top base and the bottom base are both hexagons. No, let's see, one, two, three, yep, hexagons. And the lateral faces connecting them all the way around look rectangular again. And here is a trapezoid top and a trapezoid bottom, top base and a bottom base, and they're connected again by rectangles. They don't have to be rectangles per se, they can just be parallelograms in general, but they'd be slanted in that, in that case, probably. Right? These look like, uh, if you're into um, uh, geology, all right. The natural crystalline form of many uh, chemical compounds, um, like pyrite, for example, tends to be sort of hexagonal or cubic, you know, fool's gold, things like that. Then here are some pyramids, right? The pyramids in Giza um, have square bases, right? But you could, in theory, have a, a slightly less complicated pyramid, in which case you have a triangular base or a hexagonal base. Well, in this case, this is, uh, the, I believe this is what this is alluding to. They didn't use the word in the book, a yangma. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's a slanted pyramid, right? It's not straight up. It's sort of, the point is favoring one side slightly, all right? Okay. We're going to go into some formulas. Now, um, before I do that, let me just discuss the two types of measurements that we will be um, calculating. Oh, that erased so nicely just now. <laughs> I was struggling. Oh, my, my, the markers is a little hard to get off. These are very cooperative. Um, let's see. The measurements that we'll do today, measurements of space figures, and I'm using that phrase instead because we will calculate for a sphere and other shapes as well, which are not polyhedrons per se. All right. um, they include probably what you would, would suspect volume. That isn't too faint, so if I have to, I will adjust the lines here ever so slightly. And also surface area. Right, now, um, beware. We're talking about space figures calculations for this, of this type and of that type. So we're, we're discussing things that, to begin with, are three-dimensional. Surface area is really a two-dimensional, notice the phrase area there, a two-dimensional measurement, all right? But it's a two-dimensional measurement of the faces of a 3D object. That's a mouthful, right? It's not taking into consideration the volume, right? It's kind of like the difference between area and perimeter, all right? 
a perimeter is a one-dimensional measurement, right, but of a two-dimensional object or a shape. There's a little thought cloud here. Remember perimeter. When you have something like this, we have a, something that is two-dimensional, but any one of the the measurements that we use to calculate a perimeter, which would be the measure of the distance, the sum of the distances around the shape, right? Each one of these measurements is itself one-dimensional, right? Which is why when you calculate a total perimeter, the unit that you would see is technically degree one, whatever it is, inches, feet, centimeters, millimeters, whatever. Well, when you're dealing with a surface area, you'll have um, a three-dimensional object under consideration, but you're not calculating the inside so much as you are the outside, which is similar to how a perimeter is. It's more if you can affiliate any with any sort of alternative phrase. All right, um, think outside when you think perimeter or circumference. All right, surface area is again sort of an outside measurement of a 3D object, it is taking into consideration the area of the faces. The sum of the areas of the faces. Okay. So we would add up all the faces. Um, an actual volume is a true three-dimensional measurement, through and through. Right? You're dealing with a 3D object and you're taking a genuine 3D measurement. It's the measure of capacity. Right? You might say the amount of space an object takes up. And so if you had, again, a cube or something like that, it's a bit of a drawing cube. We're trying to calculate the space inside. When you think area, right? Just the standard area, right? Again, if you're going to associate perimeter with the concept of outside of something, you you can similarly associate area with the inside of something. We would use that in the context of two D. That would be an area of something two-dimensional. Well, if you're finding essentially the next logical step here would be the inside of something that is not just 2D, but something that is 3D. Then we use the phrase space, okay? And there are specific formulas depending upon what the actual shape is. Right? Um, what might be just a good thing to keep, keep in mind is this. Perimeters and circumferences, you might have some unit, but the answer is going to be that unit to the first degree, which oftentimes we don't bother to write one. When you are looking at the answer of a surface area, right, in spite of it being a three-dimensional shape that is under consideration, the unit, because we're just adding areas, will be a unit that is squared. Right? Only when you have a volume will you have a unit that is in fact cubed, so degree three, all right? So perimeters, circumferences, unit first degree, areas of any sort, unit second degree, and then volumes are actually unit third degree, all right? All right, let's do some examples now.
something up real quick. Um, all right, I'm going to go through, uh, I'm going to be using basically formulas from this overview here, V for volume, S, A for surface area, and as long as you can identify the shape in question, you could calculate those two things from the formulas given. All right, so let's look at this first uh, example here. A little bit more light. Now try to confine myself once again. First example that you have is uh, to calculate the volume of a rectangular solid. So you see something that looks like this, basically. And then they want you to calculate the volume of a cylinder. It would technically be what they refer to as a right circular cylinder. It's circular because its bases are circles, and it's right because the, the connecting side here that wraps all the way around that surface is, um, if you unraveled it, it would be a rectangle. There's a cone as well, and then a sphere. What is important when you're looking at this is the dimensions they're giving you. I'll put them in red. 10 feet, two feet, and five feet. The only thing I would tell you to be uh, careful of when you're doing these calculations, you could definitely plug and play in terms of the formulas. Um, make sure that your units are all the same unit. Right. If they're not, then you would have to take the time to actually convert them to the same unit, whichever you choose or whatever is specified. All right, firstly, uh, there are measurements in here. This should be three inches. And then there is an interior height dimension. I'm gonna put the right angle symbol in here, sort of in perspective. This is seven inches. When you get to a cone, uh, you have a circular base, three inches again, and the same height dimension. And then the sphere, the only dimension that you need to be given when you're de dealing with a circle, really, or a sphere, is the actual radius. Okay. Right, now, as for the formulas, perhaps I'll use the faint marker for a moment. We're gonna calculate the volume of each of these first. That's pretty bad. Okay. I'm going to use green. Right, volume of what is the shape? This is a rectangular solid um, rather than a true cube. So the volume formula is the length times the width times the height. If you notice, the dimensions that are the first two dimensions of this formula, they're an area, right? A two-dimensional measurement, right? And then it's just multiplied by a third dimension, and then you get the volume then. Just that's the glare I'm worried about here. The formula for the volume of a right circular cylinder is basically the base 
like a stack of pancakes, if you can imagine it, times how tall it is, how tall the stack of pancakes is. So it's a volume that is, once again, an area. So if the bottom is a circle, it would be pi r squared right, times how tall it is. Right? The logic behind this is, again, this is an area. And this is how many layers there are, the height, h. Um, when you get into something like a cone, it's a little bit more tricky, and I'm not doing it any justice, but I'll just tell you, all right, this is a right circular cone. It turns out that the volume of a cone is realistically one-third the overall volume of a cylinder that it would fit inside perfectly. You could, in theory, test this um, with volumes of water. Right, I won't make you do that. <laughs> but look again, there is the circle, all right? And in theory, it would be like a stack of pancakes. Right? Another pancake, another pancake, another pancake to add layers to it, right? But unless you factor in this fraction here, right, you can end up with the whole cylinder rather than what should really just be one-third of it. A cone is one-third of a cylinder. Right? Then there's the volume of a sphere, right? A three-dimensional circle, if you will, right? This is really the most interesting. Um, the formula is this. It's 4 thirds times pi times the radius cubed. All right? The 4 in here comes from um, another formula that you're going to see momentarily, the surface area of a sphere. All right? um, and then you could see hidden in here is also the area of a circle. It's just that we're going to degree three, all right? To derive this formula, to do it the justice that it really deserves, I'm gonna link you some videos that explain, there's a fellow on YouTube who did such a nice job in terms of the animations, discussing the intricate derivation of this formula if you're interested. It is fascinating, all right? Now, um, if we're just doing plug and play, as I mentioned here, right? If you want to calculate the volume, what is it really? It doesn't matter which you refer to as the length, the width, and the height specifically, just that you realize that you're multiplying three things in, in sequence here. So 10, five, uh, 2, and 5 is just 1, right? So that's 20 times 5 is 100. The volume would be 100 in terms of its uh, magnitude. And then bear in mind that it's feet times feet times feet. So you could put the units in there as well. I'm just leaving them in for simplicity. What is the volume unit degree going to be as a result of feet times feet times feet? Think of that as being an abbreviation. It would be feet cubed. All right, so I have a tendency, as long as I know that the units are all the same consistently through the shape, I always worry about the unit as an afterthought, personally. Right. Now, if you get the volume of a right circular cylinder, all right, this is another situation where you have pi involved here. So try to not use 3.14, right? Use your calculator, but rig the uh, sort of um, the input to calculate pi or you and utilize pi on your calculator at least, all right? You'll get a better answer if you do that. Try not to round intermittently. Always when you have irrational numbers like that, Reserve them for dead last or hold off as long as you possibly can, right? So this is a radius, right? So I would put a three in here. And this is a height dimension, how tall the cylinder is. That is a seven there. You do have to follow the order of operations. So you would square first, making this pi times nine times seven. And then, because it's just multiplication at this point, there's a commutative property that says that you can arrange these and multiply them in any order that you like. I would combine the regular ordinary numbers yeah. first, 
and then you would have 63 pi. The volume would be 63 pi and then whatever the units are. If it's inches squared times an extra inches, it would end up being indeed inches cubed, as we expect, for a volume. If you want to get the decimal equivalent of this, just remember that you have to round it. So they might tell you round to the hundredths place, in which case 63 times you use your pi button on your calculator would give you something like this. 197.92 inches cubed, if that's the unit. Okay? For the volume. Hold on to pi for as long as you possibly can. <coughs> The volume of the cylinder, notice the dimensions have not changed, only the shape, uh, the enclosure has changed. This cone is coming to a vertex, as it would. So, since I, I could kind of cheat in a way, um, if this dimension of radius is 3 and this uh, height is still 7, right, you know that this much of it is still going to end up being 63 with a pi attached to it. Because that's the way it worked out just before, right? It would then be one-third as much of that. Remember, when you're just multiplying, and that is what you would end up with, just multiplication across the board, you have the freedom, the artistic license, to arrange the parts, the factors, in any way that you find conducive, any way that you find convenient. So what I would do, for the reason that I mentioned, which is to leave pi for dead last, because it's an irrational number, straighten out the uh, actual numbers first, right? Divide 63 by 3, essentially, if it's like one-third times 63 over 1, that's the same as 63 divided by 3. You would end up with this, 21 times pi, right, for your volume. That would technically be the exact answer in inches cubed, all right? But if you want the more, slightly more satisfying decimal equivalent, just because we've been sort of conditioned to like it that way, you should end up with this, 65.97 inches cubed approximately All right. <clears throat> and then there's the volume of the sphere All right. six inches the only measurement that you need is six All right. and again follow the order of operations so you must cube six first All right. six times six is 36 36 times another six would be 216 which means that this would be four-thirds times 216 times pi. And the unit is inches, so it would be inches cubed on the end. All right. Again, I always straighten out the regular ordinary numbers if I can help it. And leave pi for dead last, right, for when you have to finally round. Um, these figures here, all right, uh, the 216 is in fact divisible by 3. If you check your rule of divisibility for 3, in other words, if you could divide 216 by 3 nicely, no remainder, the sum of the digits should work with 3 as well. So 2 plus 1 is 3, 3 plus 6 is 9. Does 9 divide nicely by 3? Yes, then the whole thing is divisible by 3. So 3 divided by 3 is 1, and this divided by 3 is 72. Right, which means that you really just have uh, 4 times 72 which is 288. Right. Therefore, um, your volume is 288 pi inches cubed. That is the exact answer. Just maybe, albeit, I don't want to corrupt your opinion either, maybe less satisfying because it's not a decimal. This is nonetheless uh, the way that is uh, preserving all of infinity. If you're going to round it now, you would multiply two point, uh, pardon me, 288 times pi with your calculator's high degree of precision there, all right, and then round it to the hundredths place. So you should get something like 904, all right, 0.78 inches cubed. Okay, so 100 feet cubed, 197.92 inches cubed. 65.97 inches cubed and 904 and 78 hundredths inches cubed. All right. Those are just the volumes. What we'll do now is we'll calculate the surface areas. So I need the space, I'll just do that now. Different formulas, right? 
The point of this exercise is to get you comfortable with just basically plug and play. I'm just reading the shape for its dimensions appropriately, identifying the shape appropriately. That's that way you can choose the appropriate formula. And uh, making sure the units are all correct in the end. And then of course, rounding. The skill of rounding never goes away. It's never less useful in measurement. All right, now, if we are to calculate surface area, it'll start out being very intuitive, and then when you get to the shapes that are not polyhedrons, um, like a sphere, all right, we need more sophisticated techniques to determine the actual formula. Again, I'm going to link an awesome video that is animated that, if you're interested, discusses how the formula is derived. Right. If you have a rectangular solid, as in this case still, right, notice that the faces of it are all rectangles. Right. And if it's a rectangular solid, then it has six faces. Right. The formula for the surface area is abbreviated SA, and I'm going to sort of stack it. There's going to be two rectangles that are the same, so it'll be 2 times L times W, plus the two rectangles on the side that are the same, right? And we'll just change the labeling from uh, L and W to W and height, right? Plus another two, uh, that which is the top and the bottom, right? Uh, let's see, and that would be 2 times L times H, right? That's basically how it would work. These would not be written stacked. They would, as you notice on the, the photocopy, they would be more stretched out horizontally, red left to right, but this will be convenient because, because of the column that I'm doing here. <clears throat> if you're inputting the dimensions, uh, it would be something like 10 times 2 for the very bottom one down here that I'm shading in blue. Okay. Let's see. Um, so that would be what? 2 times 10 is 20, 20 times 2 is 40. And it's an area, even though we're talking about a three-dimensional shape, it, the, the surfaces, the faces of it are still two-dimensional themselves. The parts, if you will, are two-dimensional. So it's feet squared, right? 40 feet squared. If you're considering um, this uh, section back here, there's two of those. Right, so that would be a width of 2 and a height of 5. And it would be 2 times 2 times 5. So 4 times 5 is now 20 feet squared. And then there is um, uh, the back shape here, if you will. Sorry if that's a little bit messy. The back and the very front right, um, would be the length of 10 and then how tall it is, 5. I think I'm not ruining my marker here. 2 times 10 is 20, 20 times 5 is 100. So 100 feet squared, right? And then you would add them. Uh, 60 plus 100 is the surface area of 160 feet squared. Total. Got killed it. Let's see. The surface area of a rectangle, oh, pardon me, of a right circular cylinder, all right? would be this formula. Remember, it has uh, a circular top, and it's in perspective, right? So it looks like an oval, and a circular bottom. So there's the area of the circle here and the area of the circle here. Two times that area. And then there is the dimensions that is the, uh, the face that stretches all the way around, right? The curve. All right, the curved surface. Let's see. The way that it works out. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So let's do the second. Is that this? Um, if you can imagine, I don't want to make it too much of a mess. If you imagine this cylinder like a label, right? The rectangle that is separating the two circles. 
as being something like a label on a jaw. If you unfurl it, what shape is it? It's a rectangle, basically, all right? In the, using the dimensions that we have here, you would end up having to add um, the equivalents that would form the area of this rectangle. Right? And the way that, because there's pi involved here, we're talking about a circumference as well. So what you end up with is this, 2 pi r times h. Right? Notice something. These are the two circles here and here. This is the circumference, that's the distance all the way around this label, because although it is a circumference, all right. That circumference is also a length, or what you might call a base instead, if you like. Right. It is the distance all the way around the edge of this um, label, all right. And then unfurled if it was unflattened, basically, uh, unfurled like that. That circumference. is really a base dimension, or you could call it a length instead, it really doesn't matter. How tall it is is the height in this context, right, which is the equivalent of a width, right? It really is two dimensions, except that you have to calculate the first dimension from the, uh, the circumference, technically. Right? Anyhow, if you insert the numbers that you have, right, this could, you know, I'm gonna need a little bit of space, I'm gonna erase something. Here is what you end up doing. I'm going to write this firstly a little bit more cleanly over here. The surface area is comprised of two parts, mm -hmm. the circle part, the part and the label part. All right. So you have 2 times pi times the radius squared plus 2 times pi times the radius, that's the diameter, right, times the height. And I'm going to pull a couple of tricks. It isn't wrong if you don't do this, but because I, the advice that I'm giving you, which is reserve in, uh, calculating using pi, whether on your calculator or 3.14, mm -hmm. for dead last, I'm gonna purposely not um, put 3.14 here or here, right? Until later, right? So what's the radius still? It's three inches. I'm gonna basically straighten up all the other numbers first is what I'm getting at. All right, the height is still seven. All right, let's straighten this up. You square first, you get nine. Nine times two is 18 with a pi attached to it. All right, if you straighten this up, all right, you could do it in any order because it's just multiplication. Six, two times three is six. Six times seven is 42. This would be 42 with a pi attached to it. Now I know that it might seem a little alien to do this, but they're like terms, right? Normally when we c we're considering like terms, we think of this as being an X and an X, and then you combine them into just something X, a larger coefficient X. We'll do that now, all right? Just do it with a pi symbol instead, all right? Because if you use 3.14 here, and then use 3.14 here, you're gonna have to round, and that's gonna get problematic. You don't wanna round intermittently because this is gonna produce an error. You're not gonna get as nice an answer as the bottom line. So, how much pi do you have? If you think of this as being a like term combined with this like term, what is 18 plus 42? 60, right? So this is really 60 pi overall, right? Now you could use your calculator, right? 60 times whatever your the high degree of precision your calculator has, rounds it to the hundredths place, would give you 188.50 uh, inches squared because it is a surface area, right? This is the exact answer, 60 pi, and this is the approximate answer, 188.50, okay? So it's getting a little messy. I'm going to clean this up over here. The surface area for the volume, pardon me, the surface area of a cone, right, the 
derivation isn't more involved than I could do justice right now. All right, um, it should look like this. The surface area is equal to, firstly, the bottom of it is a circle. Right? So you're gonna have that area of pi r squared. But then you have to take into consideration the shape that you would get, right? If you think of this as being a label again, that is unraveled, right? the way it would work out is that you would have this. You would have an additional pi r, which is basically half of a circle, half of a circumference, right? Um, times this figure, r squared plus h squared. This um, chunk of this portion here, this much of it, is basically the Pythagorean theorem, right? Except that the labels have been changed. And ordinarily, when you have the Pythagorean theorem, Uh, we use A, B, and C, right? In this, in this case, uh, the bottom is labeled R, so we're calling it radius squared, right? Um, the A dimension would be the height dimension, right? All right, in this uh, parlance here, H squared. And together, if you went the whole nine yards with the Pythagorean theorem, you would end up having to square to solve for a hypotenuse. The hypotenuse in this context, right, is the dimension from here to the point, to the vertex. This is called a lateral height, I believe. Right. So if you multiply basically the lateral height times half of the circumference, you end up accounting for basically the area of the label. Okay, so let's plug in the numbers that we have. Again, uh, try again to reserve. Now, in this case, you may end up with uh, two irrational numbers. We'll see. All right, the radius here is three still, and it's three still, and it's three still, and the height is still seven. We'll try to clean up the regular ordinary numbers first. So if you have three squared, this chunk of it would be nine, because it's three, times three, times pi. We're going to leave it like that, all right? This chunk of it over here would be a three in front of pi. And then if you straighten out the guts here of the radical, it would be nine plus 49. You're gonna get stuck with a crummy number in this case because it's not gonna be rational, it's gonna be irrational, right? Nine plus 49 is 58. So then you have that, square root of 58. I'm gonna purposely arrange the pieces like this. This is still nine pi. I'm gonna take the coefficients essentially and put them in the front. So this will be three times the square root of 58 times pi on the end. The advantage to doing that, and I legally speaking can, arrange the parts any way you want. Commutative property says so, all right? Think of these as being basically like terms. This is something pi. And this, although it is ugly, is also something pi, right? So I have nine plus three times the square root of 58 times pi, right? That much pi in tandem. I would have to combine these and right away I can't do that because they're not, this is a regular nine and this is an irrational number. So I have to, this is the part I would make my calculator do because it would give me a higher degree of precision. Right? But do it in this arrangement, right? rather than do them separately, only for the reason that you want as good an answer as you possibly can get. And if you get a round, round dead last. Right? So I'm purposely putting this parentheses here because I factored out pi, if you will. I just put it on the end. Right? That is the common feature here and here. Legally speaking, you can do that. All right, so what would you enter? Nine. All right, you would press in your calculator first plus the quantity, if you want to be careful, use an extra parenthesis in here, three times square root of 58. 
All right, what would you get in this case? Um, you should get, this is an exact answer, right? It's unsatisfying, but it's an exact answer because it preserves infinity in both instances here and here. Square root of 58 is whatever it is in the pi value. You should actually get 100. <laughs> 0 0.05 uh, inches squared. Okay. All right. Um, just because I'm always suspicious, I'm going to do it. Okay. Nine times three. No, clear. Nine plus three times the square root of 58. You would see something like this to begin with on your screen. One parentheses is the first thing, nine. And then I'm encapsulating the second one just because I'm being very anal retentive, extra careful. Can't really trust the calculator to understand the order of operations, you know. The parentheses is, is very particular, right? That's being very specific. Right? It's better to be precise. All right, and then as an afterthought, times pi. Right? Always deal with that last. All right, and there you have it. Uh oh, getting a different figure. So I must have put the order of operations out of whack somewhere. Yeah, we do it again. Sorry. 3 times the square root of 58, parentheses, parentheses. I left out of parentheses is what it was. Okay. Thank you for calling the fire. I'm not even taking my own advice here. There's the parentheses that is the, the radicand 58. Then there's the 3 times that is the second parentheses that you see here. And then there's the last parentheses, which is enclosing the 9 with it. All right. And there you have it. A hundred point zero five approximately. Remember, the calculator is only as smart as the person programming it. And in this case, I fudged it the first time. All right. Um, all right. Last one here. With this general type of plug and play formula activity here. The surface area of a sphere right, is four times pi times the radius squared. Right. It turns out, it, it, interestingly, if you analyze this again, look for what is familiar, right? This is, again, the area of a circle, right? Pi times r squared, right? The surface area, that is the, you know, the sort of swirly uh, bowling ball surface of this drawing here, is four times as much as the area, it turns out. All right. Now, how to derive that? I'm not going to be able to do it justice right now, All right, to be honest. Uh, again, I've got a link of video that explains the intricacies animated. It's really fascinating. All right. All right. So we're going to plug and play here. The radius is 6 squared, which is 36. So this is 4 times pi times 36, which if you pull the coefficient to the front would be 144 times pi. And then the unit is inches, because we're talking about it squared, because we're talking about a surface area. That is the exact answer, 144, right? which if you now use your calculator as an afterthought, uh, should give you something like 452.39 inches squared. Okay. Adjustment here because I put my own unit correct in the book. All right. All right. Just to confirm. Yeah. All right. Four hundred fifty-two point three nine. Rounded to the hundredths place. Okay. Again, the point of this exercise is identifying the shape, identifying the dimensions that are in the shape, 
and then following the order of operations essentially in a strategic and correct fashion, right? Again, try, I know it's not always easy, and I wouldn't fault you if you round it intermittently, really, right? Try not to round until dead last. Hang on to your irrational figures like pi and the square root of something like 58 at the end, right? Because then you will get a better answer if you do that. going to happen okay. now, right? and maybe I'll turn on the projector briefly. Yeah, so I yeah. Can see Let um, me just draw the picture. For example, two, to um, they're talking about a volleyball court, and the volleyball court is a sandbox, basically. So you would have something that looks like this, a rectangular solid. It has a depth to it, like a same box. The dimensions that are quoted to you are that it is 60 feet long, this way, and it is half as much this way, 30 feet. And the depth of it, now they're trying to throw you, is 18 inches. And on top of that, they tell you that if you're gonna buy sand, Uh, for this volleyball court, that it is, this is why I should turn on my projector, because it's a word problem you have to dissect, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Yeah. I want to point out where it's telling you a conversion factor. Take a look at this. It's the same problem. Okay. Um, without adjusting my blinds, let me just read this to you. Robin needs to replace the sand in her rectangular, sa uh, recta rectangular sand volleyball court. That's the rectangle that I've simulated here. All right. The court is 30 feet wide, 60 feet long, and the sand has a uniform depth of 18 inches. All right. Immediately. All right. Notice that the units are not the same unit. Right. They're not all inches, they're not all feet. But before you jump the gun and go, ah, oh, I'll make them all feet, which I think is intuitive, granted, you know, because it's less work. Read the rest of it. See the figure below. Then it tells you this conversion factor, alludes to it here. All right. Okay. Sand sells for $27 per cubic yard. This is a conversion factor. This is the reason why I'm turning on my projector, because what you'll end up having to do a lot is translate this verbally in English to something that is more purely mathematic, more symbolic, more concise. Right. So I'm going to start with this. $27 is, is basically a cubic yard. If you dumb that down, that is like saying even though it's not a genuine equation, it's like saying this, 27 equals one yard, cubed. All right. Remember, when you have conversion factors, they're more practical when they're written in the style of a ratio. So what you might end up doing is you either have $27 on top and one cubic yard underneath it, or if it is a convenience for you, exactly that situation reversed. So you have one yard cubed, 
all the twenty-seven dollars underneath it. Remember, when you're dealing with money, the uh, it's not really a unit in the classic sense. It's not a measurement. You put dollars in the front. Okay. Now, um, this is a rectangular solid. They even tell you that. Right. So, if we were going to calculate the volume, it would be this formula to start with. What you could do is calculate the volume um, in feet exclusively or inches exclusively and then convert it to cubic yards first. Or, let's see what they're asking. All right. There's two parts to this. There's A, how many cubic yards of sand does Robin need? All right. They're asking you, they want the volume in cubic yards. So. What you're going to do is you're going to translate the individual measurements into so many yards before you multiply. So if you have 30 feet here, and you have 60 feet, and you have 18 inches, each one of these is so many yards to begin with. Right? They themselves will require a conversion factor here and here and then there. So I'm going to sneak that in. Right. Remember, uh, what's the relationship of feet to yards? It's one to three, right? So this would be really 30 feet times the conversion factor of uh, three feet is one yard. Right? If I translate this into yards and that into yards and then the 18 inches even into yards, Eventually, I'm going to get cubic yards when I multiply. Right? I just have to rig it first and convert it first. Right? So the second thing would be 60 feet times the same conversion factor. One yard is three feet. And then when you get to the 18 inches, you got to switch things up a little bit right? because you have a different unit. This is 18 inches times the relationship of inches to yards instead. This may be not as obvious, but um, if you were born in the United States, then you may recognize that the total number of inches is 36 in one yard. So one yard is 36 inches. As long as you rig it so that there's going to be a cross cancellation effect, inches down here, inches over here, you will end up with the unit that you want, namely yards. So <clears throat> what is the effect here? Feet cancels feet, feet cancels feet, inches cancels inches, right? This is going to be 30 divided by three, which is 10, right? This is gonna be uh, 60 divided by three is just 20. And this is gonna be 18 over 36, which is gonna be a half, right? So 10 times 20 times a half, right? 10 times 20, is 30, right? Make sure that I'm doing that right. Yep. Um, oh, pardon me. That's if you add them, yeah. Uh, what is 10 times 20? 200. That's 200 times a half. What's a half of 100? Right. The volume, to answer part A, is 100 yards cubed. Right. What a nice figure that is, right? Now, when we answer the question of part B, how much is it going to cost to fill this in with a depth of 18 inches of sand uniformly? All right, we're going to either use this conversion factor, or pardon me, the conversion factor oriented this way, or oriented that way. All right, the one that produces money on top is the one that we're going to go with. So if I wrote, I'm sorry for the messiness, what I just calculated, 100 yards cubed times this incarnation of the conversion factor, it's going to cross cancel by design, and then it's going to be 27 times 100, which means that the cost answer to B is $2,700 to fill this volleyball cord with sand. Okay. Next question. Three, painting a large volleyball. Geez, somebody really likes volleyball. <laughs> Who's the author of these problems is really like volleyball. Right. 
No disrespect, but jeez, you know, don't think a dead horse either. <laughs> Uh, the Camden College Athletic Hall of Fame building features a statue of a large volleyball that is in need of painting. All right, the volleyball has a diameter of 8.5 feet. It is a good habit to, based upon the description, draw a simple picture. If it's a volleyball, all right, all right, then it is a sphere shape, right? And it, uh, and so this is on a pedestal, if you will. Uh, maybe it's getting a little too bright, so I will attempt to fix my blinds. There you go. It might be a little bit better to see. This is a sphere, I swear. All right. And it's supposed to be a giant volleyball. Now, they're telling you that the dimensions of this volleyball, there's not a radius that we're specifying. They're telling you that it's a diameter. So, if it's 8.5 feet, just realize that that's a diameter. So it goes all the way across on the inside. Okay. We're going to first determine the surface area of the volleyball and then f figuring that um, one quart of paint covers about 100 feet squared, you can decide uh, how much paint to buy. All right. So the surface area of a sphere, which this is what this most closely resembles, is 4 times pi times the radius squared. Uh, just beware, the formula incorporates radius, the dimension quoted to you is a diameter, so what you would have to do in here is divide 8.5 by 2 first. Right. In other words, what's half of 8.5? Um, it should be, let's see, 4 times pi times I want to say 4.25. All right, uh, two goes into eight four times exactly, and then two goes into five uh, twice with one left over. So yes, two five. All right, that is a decimal there. So it's a decimal there. Okay. Now again, for strategically rounding last, right? Um, you would square this first. Right. 4.5 times 4.5 just to expedite is what? A uh, large number, right? Times four would give you, this is a decimal, you should get 72.25 pi. Right? That is the exact surface area. All right. All right, now, if they want you to, they don't specify how to round it exactly, but uh, Let's see what you get. Um, I'm going to use times uh, my pi button on my calculator. You should get, just to be uh, consistent with the last problems that had us round to the hundredths place, this would be about 226.98. Uh, the unit was feet, so it's feet squared for the surface area. Now, it says, this is a conversion factor, once again, hidden in here. One quart of paint covers 100 feet. If I were to dumb that down, all right, and don't ever feel bad about taking something written in grammatical English and then simplifying it, because oftentimes the author of the problem was purposely trying to complicate things. So your job is to dissect it, especially for your, your own students. You want to treat them like a baby bird, so you can partially digest this first. So, one quart is essentially 100 cubic feet, uh, pardon me, feet squared, right? So the way that um, an array, a table of conversion factors would look is often like a simple equation like this. One quart using abbreviations is 100 feet squared. If you write it in the more uh, conducive fashion, it says a ratio. So you might either use it as one quart over 100 feet squared, or if it is more conducive, more practical, 100 feet squared over one quart, whichever you need. All right. Now in this case, all right, we're trying to figure out how much paint that a person would need to buy to paint this giant sphere, all right, the volleyball. So 
Um, taking the figure that we have here, 226.98 feet squared times the appropriate conversion factor will spit out a number of quarts. If quartz is what we want, then quartz has to be above the line, and therefore it would be one, because it's one quart, all right? And 100 would have to be below the line, so that would be 100 feet squared, all right? If you purposely rig it this way, there's going to be a cancellation effect by design. Feet squared would be canceled by feet squared here. And if you divide by 100, the effect is that the decimal point would simply move over two places, all right? Which means that you would have... 2.2698 quarts, right? That would be the exact, or more precise answer, it wouldn't be exact, because um, it was rounded to begin with. Now, realistically, this is a decimal, right? It's two and change. It's two and a little bit extra. Can you buy a fraction, if you went to Home Depot and you're buying paint, can you buy a fraction of a can? Not really, all right? You might buy smaller denominations, smaller cans, but you, you might get into some trouble. So realistically, you're going to have to purposely round poorly. If you were going to round correctly, this would be two cans, right? But then you wouldn't finish painting the ball. So you'd have to compensate by rounding up, right? Even though it would be considerably bad rounding. You'd have to say that this, I'm going to need approximately three quarts. I need a little bit, and then you're going to just have extra paint as well. Okay. So three quarts. Uh, now you have this uh, three silos here. Problem. Has three silos, like on a farm, right, on his farm. Silos are each of the shape of a right circular cylinder, which means they're nice like this. That's the last problem. Okay. Uh, one silo has a diameter of 12, another, and is 40 feet tall. The second one is 14 by 50, and a third is 50 by 60, apparently. Right. 18 by 60, though. Um, what is the total capacity? of all three silos, right, in cubic feet. All of the units, to just verify, is a good habit, that all of the units are already feet, right? So cubic feet implies that we're looking for a volume, right? The volume of a right circular cylinder is the volume of the bottom area, which is always gonna be a circle, right? Times how tall it is, like a stack of pancakes. Right? So you would have to do this calculation basically three times and then um, add them together. Right. So the dimensions quoted to you here, well, they gave you a diameter, right? So what's half of, uh, what's the radius in this case? If it's 12 feet diameter, what's the radius? Six, right? Feet. And here it would be seven feet. And here it would be nine feet. Again, you notice that there's pi involved in this because there were circles involved in this. So we're going to try strategically to not incorporate 3.14 for the sake of a better answer until dead last. All right. So uh, you would have a 6 in here by 40. And you would have a 7 in here by 50. And you would have a 9 in here by 60. It's a little messy, sorry. All right, now... Um, Remember, you follow the order of operations, so you square first. This is really 36 times 40, uh, which is what? 24, carrying that, 2. Uh, 1,440, so it's 1,440 with a pi attached to it. And this is 49 times 50, uh, which would be 45. Uh, 24, 2,450 with pi attached to it. I'll just make it a little bit more obvious by putting it over here. 
And then you have uh, 9 squared is 81. 6. Uh, 48. So this last one is 4860, I believe, with a pi attached. But I'll get out of the way, I promise. Yeah, I'm just verifying. Yep. 1440, 2450, and 4860. All right. Pi, pi, pi. So if you think of them now, since we're looking for the total capacity, that's this plus this plus this. All right. They're like terms. I know that it's a little alien to have the pi symbol, all right, but don't think of it as just being like it was x, all right? This x plus that x plus that x is how much x, you know? So add these figures together and you will get a better answer, right. right? What you should get total is um, 8,750. with a pi attached to it. And then only one time, rather than three times independently, then you can incorporate the actual decimal rounded approximate of pi. All right, you'll get a much better answer. What you should get is basically this. Uh, 27,488 and 94 hundredths uh, feet cubed. So 0.94. That's 27,488.94, 27,488.94 feet cubed. That's the volume, all right? Now, the second part of this is if Gordon fills all three silos with feed for his cattle, all right, 100 cubed, there should be a comma here. Um, no, not in the context of this. written. 150 cubic feet. Uh, of feed is how much is used per day, right? And how many days will all three silos be empty, right? This is the volume of all three, right? And this is how much the cattle are eating per day. Sorry that this is cut off at that point. So that again is an example of a conversion factor. Just to free up some space here, I'm gonna erase this gobbledygook. Translate what is written in English, not especially clearly, 150 cubic feet per day, all right, is sort of like saying 150 cubic feet is, you know, one day's worth of feed. It's an awkward way of phrasing it, but this is more concise and it means essentially the same thing. Again, if you had a table of conversion factors, it often is written like this. I know it might seem a little weird to associate a, let, uh, pardon me, a volume with an amount of days, right? but that is, instead of that per, all right, would translate this to 150 feet cubed per is the line one day. That's the, the, um, the conversion factor oriented like that. And then there's the conversion factor oriented with this just upside down, essentially, which would be one day is 150 feet cubed. Okay. Now, if you're trying to figure out how many days will all three, what, how long is it gonna take in terms of days for these to empty out com completely? It is this incarnation of the conversion factor in blue and utilizing this volume that is total, that will calculate days as the, uh, the answer. All right. So essentially what you would do is take your total volume, which we just figured out, 27,488.94 feet cubed, and multiply it by the conversion fa factor oriented like this. All right. It's more or less a fraction of a one times the conversion factor. So what cancels? What is diagonal? Feet cubed, feet cubed. And what are you left with? The unit that you actually want. The bottom line is you're gonna take 27,488.94 and divide by 150. And what you are going to get is approximately 183 days. What a boring meal, though. Every day, the same thing, whatever cattle feed is. You know.
four cows. That's not a nice dotted. I'm sure they'd much rather eat grass. Okay. All right, moving on. Um, oh, I love this. This one's neat. There's a formula which is attributed to uh, Euler. Euler was a Swiss mathematician, I believe. Um, his name is spelled Euler, right? But it's actually pronounced Euler. I want to say it's German, All right, basically. Um, anyhow, I think it's Swiss. Um, there's a formula that he derived or that he's credited with, among other things, which is also on this piece of paper. All right. On the handout that is the formula sheet, right, I stole this again from your textbook. You notice that if you were to take the number of vertices, that is the corners basically of a three-dimensional shape, subtract the number of edges, and then add the number of faces, it always produces the number two, right? Which is like, yeah, so what? It basically means that if you know two out of those three uh, features, right? I'm gonna abbreviate it like this. I'll put the two in the front. Um, v for vertices, corners, minus E for edges, plus F for faces. As long as you know two out of the three variables here, you could calculate the third because there's some, well, this is a difference and partly some, all right? We'll always produce this figure two. Right. So, let's see what we have conditions here. A certain polyhedron, unnamed, right, is a many-sided shape, uh, a three, a three-dimensional um, shape made with faces. All right, has twenty vertices. That's twenty corners. So you would put a twenty here, and twelve faces. And we'll put a twelve here. Determine the number of edges that would have to be the, you know, as a result, right? If this is how many corners there are, and this is how many faces there are, a twelve-sided figure. A dodecahedron, I guess, is what that would be. All right, then figure out how many edges they would be as a result. All right, just inserting them in Euler's formula here. Euler's polyhedron formula specifically. Um, remember, I'll write it a little bit neater over here. If this is really what you have, you can um, rearrange the pieces as long as you are careful with the signs. All right, this is a positive 20, and this is a positive 12. I'm just going to group those together into one figure. All right, so it's 20 plus 12, 32. 32 minus E um, is equal to 2, still. And then you could manipulate this via algebra. Now, if you want to, just to avoid a negative, you can move the E over here first, but... I think it would be more work than it's worth, more trouble than it's worth. So I'm going to do this uh, like so. If this is in fact a positive 32, and I want to isolate E, I'm going to move 32 over equals. Remember when you solve something algebraically, you perform opposite operations. So since we have compacted this into the number 32, I'm going to move that all at once via subtraction. And whatever you do to one side, you're obligated to do to both sides. Over here, it's going to strategically cancel. And over here, it's going to strategically combine via the appropriate uh, sign combination rules. Right? We're dealing with either adding or subtracting, and we decide based upon the combination. So if you see one of each, it's going to actually subtract to produce the, um, the magnitude, the actual digits here, right? in which case I'm going to get 30. And then on the opposite side, I still have this minus E here. Let's make sure that the sign is appropriate too. The sign of the outcome 30 is going to match the larger magnitude, so since that's distance from zero. So if the larger distance is a negative distance, right, you're going to have a negative 30 here. Now you could reason it through like so. We're not done until this is just regular ordinary E, right, as opposed to negative E. 
if this is negative when that is negative, then this would be positive when that is positive. And the answer is going to be positive 30, which would make sense because in real, when you're talking about geometry, there's no such thing as negatives really. Right. Um, but if you're not convinced that way, remember you could always talk yourself the word algebraically. This is really a coefficient of negative one. If you wanted to move negative one for the sake of solving, over equals, you would divide by negative one and then divide by negative 1 here to be consistent. A negative divided by a negative is a positive, right? And the same thing would result here. So the number of edges would be 30 edges for a dodecahedron, it sounds like. If it has 12 faces, I'm going to go ahead and assume it's a dodecahedron. Um, moving on. Now we have this volume of a hexagonal prism fish tank. Good times. <laughs> and the illustration is over here, adjacent. This is a prism problem. Right? They, they tell you that specifically. But let's discuss that for a minute. If it's a prism, then that means that the bases, there are two. This is the first base, this is the second base are the same regular polygon, right? or the same polygon in general, I should just say. They're both hexagons in this case. Right? And the lateral faces, which are the adjacent sides that run parallel to each other, are rectangles in this case, right? rather than a general par parallelogram. Right? Frank's fish tank is in the shape of a hexagonal prism. Right? Use the dimensions shown in the figure and the fact that here is a conversion factor. One gallon is 231 inches cubed. To A, determine the volume of the fish tank in cubic inches, and then B, determine the volume of the fish tank in gallons instead. We would have to incorporate this conversion factor at that point. Round your answer to the nearest gallon, a whole number. Now, in a situation like this, we don't have a formula specifically for um, a prism that is a hexagonal prism. We have a generalization here, right? The volume of water that would take up uh, this particular prism in the, uh, the equation sheet is air, volume is equal to the area of the base, that's what the capital B stands for, times the height. It's more or less the same concept of a cylinder is a pile of pancakes, the layers of the same shape. In this case, the layers of the pancake shape is a hexagon instead. Right? Now, to calculate the area of a hexagon, what we would have to notice is that a hexagon is either a bunch of triangles, you could look at it as that way, or it's just really the same um, trapezoid butted up against itself here. You know? So this bottom here, and I, I'm obscuring it, unfortunately, aside from my body, but with the, the marker here. The dimensions of this trapezoid, half, and it would be the same here and here, all right, is written in the drawing. Right, so uh, just to make it a little bit larger, here's the trapezoid. All right, they're telling you in the picture that the, um, the dimension this way is 8 inches. And the dimension this way is, I'm going to say it's 16. I don't know if they specified that or I just concluded it. Yeah, well, that's a little bit hard to see in the dog. Oh yeah, they're telling you above. All right. In the picture, there's the dimension that is all the way across, but it's up here rather than on the inside. All right. So without having to prove that it is in fact uh, something of a diameter of 16, it's not really a circle, so I'm not going to use that word. The dimension here would in fact be superimposed downward also. All right. That's one half of the bottom. All right. Anyhow. If this is a trapezoid, we have a formula established 
uh, for the area of a trapezoid. And the area of a trapezoid is equal to one half times the height times the sum of two bases. Right? This is a base and this is a base in this formula. That's how it would be labeled. Okay? The height dimension is coincidentally eight inches as well. It seems to be um, uh, a very nice example of a hexagon. I don't know, I don't want to necessarily describe it as a regular hexagon, but uh, uh, it's sort of leading me in that direction. I right? uh, really should verify that before I call it a regular hexagon. Anyhow, this is 8 plus 16, essentially, and this height is still 8 because it's in the picture here. All right, and then we follow the order of operations appropriately, which means that we should add uh, the contents of this parentheses first, namely 8 plus 16. And what do you get? You get 24 times 8 times a half. Right. Now, um, you could do this in two steps, or you could be strategic, and I don't want to complicate things unnecessarily. But um, here's what's going to happen. All right? This is only going to be half of the bottom, right? There's going to be exactly a second one of these as well, right? And this. Uh, the way that I have written it here. This is the first half of it, and this is going to be a second half of it. So the bottom line is that there's going to be two of this identical shape, of a, a trapezoid, right? a second one up here. So that I can incorporate that into the formula here. It's going to be the total area of the trapezoid, uh, pardon me, the, the, the area of the hexagon is two times the area of a trapezoid. The trapezoid. So the area formula of a trapezoid has got a half as part of the calculation. Right? A half times eight times the sum is equal to 24. So if I just incorporate an extra two in here, I could spare myself a little bit of work. Right? which means that this is going to end up being 2 times a half times 8 times 24. I know that probably for most of us, and I'm guilty of this myself as well, you want, when you're doing this, to go um, in baby steps. And there's, and there's no sin in that, really. It's being very careful, all right? But when you develop a level of comfort after you've done enough of these types of problems, you start to be a little bit more daring, and you do exactly what I'm doing, which is you're going, well, there's going to be two of these. So before I actually multiply, and I know that that's all I'm doing, I could take advantage of this commutative uh, relationship going on here. It's just a bunch of things being multiplied. So if I throw in a two here, all right, I could spare myself having to divide at all. all right? And then it really is just strategically 8 times 24. So that's 32, carry the 3, 16 plus 3 is 192, right? That would be the area of this bottom hexagonal pancake, if you will. 192, and since it's an area, it would be in inches, inches squared. Right? The volume of a prism, and it's not specified, is capital B times H. It's called capital B to be general because that's the area of whatever shape the base is. Well, we just calculated the area of the base. The area of the base is 192 inches squared because it's a hexagon or two trapezoids adjacent All right, with a common side. All right. So think of it as being pancake layers of hexagons basically all the way up, all right? How tall is the actual fish tank according to this diagram? Uh, it's a little bit hard to see because it's pixelated, but I wanna say that's 24 inches. So what we would have to do is multiply 192 now times 24, okay? And what you should get 
is 4,608. The total volume, pardon me, the volume is 4,608. Since it's inches squared times inches to the first degree, you add them, you get inches cubed. That is the answer to part A. Determine the volume of the fish tank in cubic inches. Well, it's 4,608 cubic inches. All right. Now, the second part of this is incorporating a conversion factor to calculate what this would be um, in a volume of, of, of gallons instead. All right. This is where it comes from. They're telling you, well, one gallon is 231 inches cubed. So if you translate that, into a, the appropriate conversion factor oriented that is with one uh, either the one on top or the 231 on the top we can get it to produce a certain number of gallons instead of inches cubed right here's what we have to work with we have the figure we just calculated 4608 inches cubed and i have a conversion factor that relationship is 1 to 231 come on what would you do? Yeah. So if I want gallons as an answer, I need gallons above the line. And if I want to cross cancel inches cubed, then I need inches cubed on the bottom. That will force the number one here and the number 231 there. The effect is this strategically cancels this. It realistically is going to be 4,608 divided by 231. That's the way the math would work out. So what is that in terms of a decimal value? Um, you should get uh, something like 19.94, right? Which if we're gonna round to the nearest gallon, that is the ones place essentially. So based upon a nine being here, this is about 20 gallons. It'll come become a dud as well. Right, you should get about 20 gallons. Right. Next one here, uh, volumes involving prisms. I need a sip of water, sorry. Determine the volume of the remaining solid, that is the solid that would be left out over after you subtract out the cylinder, the prism, and the uh, rectangular solid. Right. Which is also, you could call it a square prism if you like. Um, after they've been cut. All right. So let's derive sort of a unique formula for this purpose. Um, the volume that is remaining, I'm just going to call this V with a little subscript, remaining, is going to be the volume of the beige area, since it, it seems to be beige, right. minus each of these things, you could do them separately if you want, but rather than subtract them separately, especially since one of them is going to involve a circle, therefore it's going to involve pi, therefore it's going to involve an irrational number, therefore it's going to involve some kind of rounding. Let's make this a sum, all right? A sum of these three things. The volume of the cylinder plus the volume of the prism plus the volume of the sort of, uh, it's really a square, it's a rectangular solid, but they're calling it a square prism as an alternative. Right. So we can calculate the volume of each of these three things first, add them, and then subtract one time rather than subtract several times. All right. um, each one of them is going to have their own little issue that we have to deal with here, right? Again, the one that involves um, pi, we're going to hold off on rounding as long as we possibly can. So what we'll do is we'll figure out what the formulas are. The volume of the cylinder, I should maybe stick with the colors that I've already decided to. Um, 
the volume of the cylinder is going to be the pancake bottom times how tall it is. Uh, the volume of the uh, triangular prism is going to be some derivative of this. It's going to be the area of the base times the height. Right. Now I'll put it in green so I don't have yellow. Um, capital B times H. Oh, I hope that's not too faint. I'm sorry. This particular green mark is a little bit darker. And the volume of this uh, square prism, because it's the base is a square, is basically going to be uh, length times width times height. Okay. So we have all the dimensions quoted to us in here. Um, when we get to the triangular base, we're going to have to incorporate the area of a triangle at that point. So um, let me do that. This is going to be base times height divided by 2 times height. It's a different height dimension. It's how long it is this way. All right. And now I'll throw in some numbers finally. All right. What is the radius of this bottom pancake, if you will? It's 2, so it would be 2 squared. How long is this? One would assume that this is butted up right against the edge of the uh, beige rectangle here. Um, and that apparently is 3 inches. So one would assume that it's 3 from here to here. Okay. Um, similarly, the height dimension, that is this volume of this sort of yellowish prism here, is also 3 inches. I should be a good guy and verify just visually here. These are all the same unit, so that's cool. All right. And um, then I'll incorporate the appropriate dimensions here. The height of this triangle, bottom, imagine it as being a pancake itself. It's just a weird shaped pancake. All right. Would be 4. And its base is 6 in this case. So it's 6 times 4 divided by 2, then times the length this way would be the height. Uh, we might call that uh, 3 again. All right. And then you have 4 by 4 by 3 again. Okay. Let's follow the order of operations appropriately. You square before you multiply. It's a more sophisticated form of multiplication. Two squared is four. So this is four times three. This is 12 pi. All right, leave it like that. Um, this is six times four, 24, divide by two would make this 12 times three, which would make this 36 uh, inches cubed. I'm gonna leave out the unit for right now just to make it less ugly. As I have sloppy handwriting. Right. Um, no pi, of course, because this is a triangle. Triangular. Sorry, I'm doing that. 36 is the figure that you would end up with, a number. Right. Um, and then over here you have uh, 4 times 4 is 16, 16 times 3 is 48, right? So this would be 48. Right. All right, now. You can't immediately add these because one of them has an irrational number in it here, right? You would have to convert it to a decimal first, right? Uh, what you might do is um, treat this as if it was just X, you know, and these were just regular numbers. Combine those two first, all right? This is all going on inside of a parenthesis, mind you. Um, 36 plus 48. 14 carry the 1 is uh, 134. So this would be 134 inches cubed, because that's the unit, that's the volume that we've calculated, plus 12 pi inches cubed. Right. Okay. Now at this point, um, I'm going to leave that alone. I'll come back to it later. I'm going to straighten out with the, the beige container that is encompassing all of these here, what that would be. Right, I'm just going to write that in black. All right. This is a rectangular solid, so this is, again, a length time, a width times a height. So you have 20 by 3 by 8. 
Um, 3 times 8 is 24. 24 times 2 is 48. This should be 480. All right, inches cubed. All right. So what you can do is write this out first, and then you can whittle it down. You have the overall beige uh, container is 480 inches cubed minus the sum of these two things, all right? Um, 134 inches cubed plus 12 pi inches cubed. Again, I'm just being extra careful because I want to make sure that I get the best answer that I can get. So I'm trying to strategically leave my irrational number pi until dead last if I can help it. At least I've written it out now because this is as I probably would type it into a calculator. Right? No rounding until the end. All right? So if you do that, uh, here's what you might do. Type 480 minus a parentheses 134 plus the second parentheses 12 times pi, close the parentheses, close the parentheses. Right. And we'll verify that this is correct. Okay. 480 minus 134 plus 12 times pi, close the parentheses, and then remember there's a second one. And you should get this. Uh, I think I fudged something here. This is not 134. <laughs> That's why. All right, 14. I multiplied and then I added. This is dodo. Sorry. All right, that's eight. Good thing I always check. Well, not no, but I do check. All right, so this is 84. Sorry, the number that should be here. Wake up. Right. The number that should be here is 84. I'm sorry. When you write stuff, and if, if there's any lesson to be learned from my dodo errors that I made, all right, is that you can catch the mistake either before you know before you calculate or after the fact when you're verifying, right? And then other people can see your mistake as well. This is the thing that a person really has to come overcome the, the ego defense that you know as a teacher, and you're like I'm always right. You're not always right, all right. Sometimes you make a mistake, all right? So. Teach your students not to be shamed by the error, you know. If you write what you're thinking, other people can help, you know. That's really more important, right? It's communal. All right, so let me just take out one little thing here. Eight. 84. Now, uh, if all goes according to plan, you know, I'll show you. If I've entered this correctly, and I tried to fix it, as an afterthought. 480 is the, the whole, and then there's the sum. 84 is the two other parts, and the 12 pi here is the uh, circular cylinder part. Right. So, uh, let's see what we get. Right. There's an error again, I will verify. All right, there you go. That looks good. All right, 350, yes. 358.30 is what you should get for the volume that is left over. 358.30 inches cubed. Okay. Alright. Um, two more and then we're done. Let's see. These are pretty easy. This is an example of calculating a volume of square-based pyramid. So let's take a look at this. Uh, let's do a okay. 
Um, determine the volume of a pyramid. All right, the volume of a pyramid is, it turns out, one third the area of the base times the height. I think that is correct. Um, is that right? No. Uh, yeah, times the height, that's correct. All right, because this is an area unto itself. And an area being something squared, this is an extra dimension, would make it cubic. All right, it turns out that if you were to calculate the area of a pyramid encased inside of a full-size cube, it takes up one-third the amount of space. It's sort of like the relationship between the area of, I should say, the volume is one-third, the uh, full-size cube. The area of a triangle is a half of a, of a rectangle, right? That's where the half is embedded in the formula, right? It's always get, the area of a triangle is always half of a full-size rectangle that would wrap and in, 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 engulf it, all right? Uh, when you're dealing with a third dimension, right, the volume of a pyramid is one-third the volume of a full-size rectangular solid or cube, if you like. Right? That's why this is one-third. So, um, again, they use a capital B for the area of the base because the base of the pyramid could be, in theory, any shape, any polygon, right? But this one happens to be square. So, uh, the area here is uh, five times five, because those are the dimensions of the square base, right, which makes it 25. How tall it is, is the inside height. That apparently is six inches. And then you would multiply by a third. So you could do it in any particular order. All right? uh, probably the easiest math that you can do is to arrange it like so. All right? Cancel this, make that two, this is 50. Remember, you could cross-cancel even things that are not immediately adjacent, but they're separated. As long as everything's being multiplied, these are the dots here, all right, you can get away with cross-simplifying like this before you multiply. Anyhow, the unit is inches, so this could be in 50 inches cubed for your volume. Um, number nine is a worthy use of our time because it is... Developing a conversion factor, you will see. This seems to show up every uh, section in this chapter. And then incorporating it into the other problems. All right, now look at this, what you have here. You have a cubic yard, convert one cubic yard to cubic feet. They're asking you essentially this. One yard cubed, to use an abbreviation, is equal to how many cubic feet? This is going to be a conversion factor, right? Here's a nice drawing that's already done here, right? I would suggest if you if you are given a drawing, then do one yourself. Draw a simple cube. It doesn't have to be chopped up like this, right? And then label the dimensions, all right? Uh, duh. Label the dimensions yard by yard by yard, right? That's what a volume would be, right? Three things multiplied. What is one individual yard in terms of feet? One yard is three feet. So it would be three feet this way, it would be three feet this way, and it would be three feet this way. So if volume overall is one times one times one in yards, what would it be in feet instead? It would be three times three times three. Instead of one times one times one, because it's different units. Therefore, one cubic yard is in fact, nine times three is 27 feet cubed, right? That's the answer to part A, right? This is a conversion factor, just not written in the style of a ratio, right? When you have the subsequent question, question B, convert 8.9 cubic yards, right, into so many cubic feet, we could rig our little um, machine here to answer this question incorporating the conversion factor that we have established. Just write it in the appropriate orientation. Right? If you want to cancel out yards cubed, put yards cubed on the bottom. 
if feet squared, uh, pardon me, feet cubed are what you want above the line, then you would put feet cubed here. And incidentally, I'm saying feet cubed because cubic feet is the same thing. It's just an alternative in English. All right. So, um, what are the, where do the numbers have to go? If you put the unit yards cubed down here, then one has to follow it. Okay. Well, it's in front of the textbook. And then 27 would have to go up here. Right. The effect is cross cancellation by design, and therefore you would just have to multiply 8.9 times 27. All right. And what you should get is 240.3 feet cubed to answer uh, part B here. Right. When you get to part C, right, it is the same kind of question, just sort of reversed. You're starting with feet cubed. So if you take the figure that's given to you, 749.25 feet cubed, and you take the same conversion factor, but you invert it here, so that there's a cross cancellation effect of feet cubed, and you get yards cubed as an answer. When you decide, and then you should, always decide where the units go first, that will ultimately force you to put the one appropriately here, and the 27 appropriately there. All right. As a result, feet cubed cancels feet cubed, and then it realistically is going to end up being um, 749.25 divided by 27 because it's under it. All right. So therefore, what you get, you should get uh, 27.75, I believe. Yards cubed. All right, in response to question C here, part C. All right, so you got uh, 27, 240.3, and 27.75, I believe. All right, here's the last question, 10. All right, um, it's similar to that uh, pool problem, I believe. It's just, <laughs> this actually made me laugh when I read it. All right, and you'll see why in a moment. It's just the peculiar usage of what the person is doing right, with their pool. Madeline, I believe is how you pronounce that, recently purchased a home, good for her, with a rectangular swimming pool. Right? And I'm guessing it's in ground. All right? um, the pool is these dimensions. It is 30 feet long, 15 feet wide, and it has a uniform depth of 4.5 feet. All right? Maybe not in ground, maybe it's above ground. All right? Anyhow, Madeline lives in a cold climate, and so she plans to fill the pool in with dirt right, to make a flower garden, which is nice. I really shouldn't be making fun. But you didn't pick up this pool and move it to Antarctica. You, they already had it there, you know, so you just don't like your pool is what it is. And now you're going to fill it in with dirt. That just tickles the hell out of me. I'm sorry. Anyhow, um, uh, let's see. How many cubic yards? All right, notice that they're changing the unit here. Of dirt will Madeline have to purchase to fill in the swimming pool? We can borrow the conversion factor from before if we need to. One yard cubed is 27 cubic yard, uh, uh, feet cubed. Okay, now let's see. It's a rectangular swimming pool and it has three dimensions. So it's something that looks like this essentially. To visualize, not very good drawing, but Something like that. Now imagine it's filled with dirt instead of water. All right. And the volume formula for such a thing is length times width times height. So you could um, convert each individual thing into uh, yards first. In this case, it wouldn't bother because we already have a conversion factor. Do it as an afterthought. All right. So what will we do? We'll do um, 30 feet times 15 feet and then 4.5 feet. And we'll get an answer in cubic feet, granted, but we can fix that as an amplitude. All right. What you should end up with, I believe, is uh, 30 times 15 times 45 is 2,025 feet cubed. That's feet times feet times feet is feet cubed. And then borrow the conversion factor from before. That will convert it to cubic yards because that's what they're asking for. So um, we're going to rig it 
The conversion factor, like so, feet cubed down in the bottom, yards cubed above the line, it's one and therefore 27 underneath. And then you're gonna essentially divide 20, 25 by 27, right? This justifies the cancellation effect, right? If it's top times top, then it's 20, 25 on top, and it's one times 27 would be 27 underneath it. All right, what do you end up with? Uh, do you have to know it's an exact figure? That's cool. All right, you end up with exactly 75 cubic yards of dirt. This Madeline is a nice person, but a strange person, apparently. I don't, I don't think a person, I've never had a house with a pool, and they're, they're a maintenance issue, I suppose, but that is quite a big flower pot. <laughs> you know, 30 feet by 15 feet. Right. And rather deep, I might add, too, you know. Um, hopefully it is in ground, because then um, you'd have to climb up it <laughs> to, to water your vegetables or what have you. Yeah. All right, enough of that silliness, boy. Um, that is it for now. Let me turn this off, and I'll tell you what's going on. All right, we are done, if you look at the calendar, with Chapter 8. All right. All right. Uh, you guys here. All right. We just did section 8.4. That's the last chapter. We started with uh, chapter 7, 7, 1, 7, 2, 7, 3. We've gone through 7 and through 8 now. I'm going to give you a test on Wednesday. All right. You don't have to submit anything. Once again, I'll just give you the credit for it. But what I want you to do is basically make sure that you're doing your homework. All right. So here's what will have happen. All right. Uh, for homework, First and foremost, finish uh, your my lab assignments, your homework, right, by uh, Wednesday night. All right, that includes section eight four because we just finished that. And then uh, what I'll do is I'll mail you. Um, yes, the state has 1305 um, Test number two. So right, just so you can have it mm -hmm. right, on Wednesday. All right. okay. Then I'll shoot a video for solutions. Again, uh, you won't have to submit anything to me for test number uh, two. I'll just give it to you as a freebie. I want you to spend your time finishing your MyLab assignments but because that experience is how you will assimilate the material. It's more important than that, okay? And this cap, the way I've rigged your, your grade calculation, this is really 50% of your grade. So what do you want to spend time on? You want to do your homework, all right? All right. Thank you guys for listening, and I'll um, I'll message you between now and then. Okay. Be careful out there.